One day some twisted son of a bitch is bound to teach you a thing or two about living in this cold, godforsaken world. Workers will begin removing fuel rods on Monday at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. This is the first critical step in what is to become a decades-long decommissioning process. Tokyo Electric Power Company workers will launch the operation from the number four reactor building. There are more than 1,500 assemblies of fuel rods in the building. Most of them are used and highly radioactive. The building was damaged by a hydrogen explosion in March 2011. The workers will use a crane attached to a specially built structure. Each worker is only allowed to work for two hours a day because of the high radiation levels in the building. A manager told NHK World that TEPCO is confident the operation can be carried out safely. The same operation has been conducted more than 1,200 times at nuclear plants, including other facilities. We're not trying anything new. Experienced workers will do what they have been doing for years. TEPCO officials say it will take more than a year to remove all the fuel rods from the building. The workers will then have to remove the fuel rods from three other reactor buildings. They estimate that the entire decommissioning process will take up to 40 years. Now in Japan, a group of government officials has decided to come clean and admit that residents of Fukushima may never return to their homes. They say that radiation levels there cannot be brought back to normal anytime soon and are urging the leadership to abandon its promise to make the area fit for living in. But only a handful of those residents actually want to go back more than two years after an earthquake and tsunami crippled the Daiichi nuclear power plant. And here's one of the main reasons for that. Ideally, the radiation level should be just one milliserviette per year, since this is an unreachable target for Japan. The government reportedly hopes to ensure people aren't exposed to doses of more than 20 times that. However, in some of the worst affected areas, Geiger counters show measurements of around 50 times the recommended level, and that's halfway to cancer-causing levels. RT's Alexei Yaroshevsky brings us this report from the Exclusion Zone. It's hard to say what gives you a creepier feeling, the trail of destruction left by the 2011 tsunami or the houses untouched by natural disaster but abandoned after the nuclear accident. Walking through the deserted streets of the Fukushima exclusion zone, we can see plenty of both. Technically, we're now well within the Fukushima no-go zone. We're just 10 kilometers from the nuclear power station. These houses ravaged by the tsunami in 2011 still stand here, nowhere near to being restored. You'll be surprised to learn that radiation levels here are in fact lower than in some of the European cities. And this prompted the decision by the Japanese government to allow the people to return to their homes. But scientists say that's suicidal because radiation migrates and because it exists in hotspots scattered all across the area. So in the hotspots there is a, a huge amount of the radioactive material is concentrated and stored. It is almost impossible to find out all the hotspots to shut down or remove all the radioactive contaminated material from their houses. We actually stumbled upon this process. Radiated material from personal belongings to contaminated soil is put in plastic bags and buried. The radiation meter went berserk even from a considerable distance. Imagine our surprise when we found similar levels in an area which had never been included in the no-go zone. I've traveled to the Chernobyl exclusion zone more than a dozen times and this was probably the scariest episode when we put a radiation meter on the ground on a layer of moss and it produced more than 800 microrongians per hour. That is 40 times more than the normal human radiation level. Here, 60 kilometers from the Fukushima nuclear power plant. The readings are certainly less than that. This is close to the average level of the ghost town of Pripyat in the Chernobyl zone. Only with one exception, the place where I'm at right now, more than 10,000 people are currently living. Mrs. Morizono is one of them. She bought a radiation meter and now patrols the area looking for hotspots. We had after-school classes for children at our house, but had to close it because of high radiation. In her short life, this girl has already got used to seeing a lot of radiation meters. Just like Mrs. Morizono, her mother joined an NGO group of ordinary women, united by fear for the future of their children and distrust of the government's actions. 
We're sending our data to government and TEPCO officials every day, and we get no reply. Don't see any action from them. As if they're trying to play down the scale of things. Meanwhile, our children are already suffering from thyroid issues. The voice of dissent is now intensifying, despite assurances from TEPCO as spent nuclear fuel rods are removed from Reactor 4 at Fukushima Daiichi. We have it under control. It's a challenging process, but we have the equipment to perform it. Anti-nuclear protesters in Tokyo say no one should be allowed back into the Fukushima area until it's completely safe, which in truth may not happen for centuries. Their picket has just surpassed 800 days, and they will stay longer, they say, to force their government into rethinking its nuclear policies. Alexey Roshevsky, RT, reporting from Japan. We end tonight with a mystery from the deep. Scientists on the West Coast are at a loss to explain what is killing sea stars, also known as starfish. Ben Tracy says in some places, 95% of the starfish population has died. Along these edges here, there would have been sea stars, orange and purple sea stars at low tide. Marine biologist Pete Ramondi showed us the tide pools along California's Monterey Bay. Thousands of bright sea stars usually line these shores. In less than two months, they've vanished. How big of a mystery is this as to what's going on here? It's immense. I mean, that's probably, from a scientific point of view, one of the most intriguing things is we have no obvious culprit. His University of California Santa Cruz research team is finding six sea stars underwater, their limbs falling off, their bodies disintegrating. How quickly does it go from healthy sea star to nothing? A sea stars can go from perfectly healthy to completely decomposed overnight. This time-lapse video shows a sea star infected with white lesions. One by one, it loses each of its arms. This happened in just seven hours. This wasting disease is typically caused by bacteria. It often happens during El Nino years when ocean temperatures warm and bacteria grows more quickly. But there is no El Nino now, and the disease is more widespread than ever, stretching from Alaska to Southern California. This was a healthy sea star population last year near Vancouver, Canada. This is what it looks like now. We've never seen it like this, never. It's changing the ecosystem on the coast because sea stars eat these black-shelled mussels. So these mussels are just going to take over because nothing's eating them anymore. That's right. Scientists say they don't know how much worse this die-off will get, and that it could be generations before these shores are once again painted purple and orange. Ben Tracy, CBS News, Santa Cruz, California. The Asian Development Bank has released an alarming report on climate change. It predicts that at least one million people in East Asia will be forced to relocate by 2050 if some governments fail to take any measures against rising sea levels. The report analyzes how Japan, China, South Korea and Mongolia will be affected by global warming. It uses data released by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, a United Nations group of scientists. It predicts that in Japan, about 64,000 people in coastal areas will be forced to migrate inland by 2050. The report also predicts that the total cost to reduce the damage for the four countries every year until 2050 is over 36 billion U.S. dollars. The money will be needed to build red levees and create artificial beaches, among other measures. Analysts say the governments should be able to fund this amount as it's 0.3% or less over the four countries' combined gross domestic product. The sea level rise will be caused by the melting of ice in polar regions due to global warming. The report points out the importance of reducing greenhouse gases and also taking measures to reduce the damage.
delegates at the UN Climate Change Conference in Warsaw have reacted sharply to Japan's decision to dramatically scale back its target for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The Japanese government on Friday officially decided to target a 3.8% emissions cut by 2020 from 2005 levels. The figure is equal to a 3.1% rise from a UN benchmark year of 1990 and also reserves the, reverses the previous 25% reduction target. The Japanese government set the new target under the assumption that all of the country's nuclear reactors will remain idled. The nuclear reactors were taken offline following the accident at a nuclear plant in Fukushima in March 2011. At the UN Climate Change Conference, which opened in Warsaw on Monday, many participants criticized Japan for making a decision that clearly reverses the trend. Referring to the announcement, Japan was given the dishonorable Special Fossil of the Day Award for its lack of eagerness to address global warming. The International NGO Climate Action Network presents the award to countries that have done the most to block progress at the UN Climate Change Conference. A high-ranking EU official says that gaps are closing on every issue about Iran's nuclear program. The EU is coordinating discussions among six world powers in the negotiations with Iran. Delegates from the United States, Russia, China, France, Britain and Germany met for three days earlier this month with Iranian negotiators but failed to reach an agreement. The five permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany have been demanding that Iran stop enriching uranium that could be used to develop nuclear weapons. The EU official said divisions are narrowing even in the core issues over the first step both sides will take over the next six months. The official also said there are still many technical problems remaining such as how to examine whether the demands are being met. The six nations and Iran will restart their negotiations this Wednesday in Geneva.